Hi everyone and welcome to this webinar. My name is Andrea Oswald and I work for Eurodis within the Rare Barometer team and I will be the host of this webinar today. Today we will discuss the findings from the Rare Barometer survey on the future of rare diseases and we will also discuss how you can use the survey findings in your own advocacy and also how it can support the 30 million reasons campaign. Midway through this webinar, we will do a question and answer session. So please feel free to use the Q&A tool in the menu to ask us any questions that you might have. We also encourage you to use the chat to introduce yourself and maybe tell us a bit why you are here with us today. So on the panel today, we have Anna Cole, who, uh, who was leading the uh, Rare 2030 Foresight study and is now leading the 30 Million Reasons campaign together with Jenny Steele. And we have Jess Jessie Dubief from uh, Rare Ordis as well. She's working in the Rare Barometer team and uh, together with Arvan Barchunot, she was uh, designing the survey. So, Anna, if you can start by telling us why this survey is unique and what it's been used for. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to see you all. Hopefully, um, this survey will serve as an illustration, really, of how grassroots um, activities and opinions can actually lead to some high level um, policy making. So the survey was part of a larger foresight study, as Andrea let us know, called Rare 2030. Um, where it gathered hundreds of key opinion leaders and patient advocates, I think many of which are here with us today, to try to recommend um, and shape what the future of rare disease policy should look like, and specifically by, by 2030. So it was actually called upon, this whole exercise, by um, a number of European institutions in the kind of natural uh, policy making cycle, and it resulted in this publication of recommendations that um, spanned across eight themes from diagnosis to research to access to treatments um, and was really designed chapter by chapter to present the unmet needs, the issue, the goal and the vision coming from this uh, expertise and consultation and a set of actions. And those actions were very uh, specifically shaped not only by this panel of experts, um, a new generation of advocates, but also very much from the results um, of the rare barometer survey that we're gonna to present today. So uh, if we can have the next slide, um, just to let you know quickly, as Andrea also mentioned, this is kind of the first stage of an even larger campaign to promote a new, more coordinated, more updated um, plan um, framework for, for policies in the field of, of rare diseases. And Eurydice, along with many um, of its partners, as well as members of parliament, um, and now a few member states um, in part of the European Council, are concretely calling for an action plan on rare diseases. So the details of this plan are very much um, supported by the recommendations coming out of Rare 2030. Um, again, they really span every sort of um, facet and approach that's needed to address all of the unmet needs that people living with rare diseases still face today. Um, and so hopefully each one of you will find um, something that, that speaks to you in, in your uh, point of view as a stakeholder. I know we have a number of people from um, companies. We also have a number of physicians uh, leading reference networks. We have um, those in our audiences who have probably worked on uh, national plans. So really a nice um, span of, of, um, of an audience who hopefully each will find their own role to play um, in using these recommendations in your own advocacy work, but also helping support us in something that can only happen um, if we do it together. So Having mentioned the fact that we covered uh, or would like to cover a number of uh, approaches, of themes, um, of, of pillars, really, of, uh, of a, an action plan, any approach that you would need to rare diseases, it's for these reasons, uh, for this reason, um, that we asked questions in this last rare barometer survey across this large broad span um, of topics. For some of them, we had um, already some evidence base, if you will, of what people living with rare diseases think and already experience um, in these areas. For other ones, we didn't, and it's for that reason that we asked them in this survey. So maybe, Jesse, now you can let us know um, in more detail what it is that we 
already knew, um, still know, and hope to learn in the future. Thank you, Anna. So yes, we the the way we designed uh, the survey on the future of rare diseases is that we wanted to have really uh, recommendations, the rare 2030 recommendations lying on solid ground. So we first looked at we what we already had. Uh, based on previous rare barometer surveys, and we had quite a lot uh, that we could use for the recommendations. But there were also some topics that were not covered or not fully covered, or for which we could, did not have uh, information that could let us think that people would like what what people living with rare diseases would like for the future. So uh, we added questions uh, on several topics. We included questions on several topics in this survey. Uh, so you can see here that on diagnosis, we already had some information with the aged care survey, but we added some uh, questions on people live, living with rare diseases opinion on prenatal and newborn screening. We also had some information on healthcare uh, in the aged care survey. We know that people living with rare diseases have a worse experience of healthcare than people living with uh, common chronic diseases. And we also had some information in the COVID-19 survey about um, in the open questions, uh, people told us a lot about uh, their experience of remote healthcare. So we wanted to add questions on remote healthcare, especially, and also on cross-border healthcare, access to cross-border healthcare by 2030. Um, we also had already information on um, people-centered care in the juggling care survey. Uh, but we wanted to see what was the level of importance of social aspects for people living with rare diseases by 2030. So we added questions on, on that aspect. And also uh, in partnership with patients, we asked especially patient representatives how they were willing to participate in research. And also we asked everybody, uh, all people living with rare diseases, what were to them research areas and research priorities for 2030, and also their expectations uh, to access treatments and therapies within the next 10 years. But for regarding data, we had quite a, an extensive uh, survey on data, and we felt that no further questions were needed in the, uh, the survey on the future of rare diseases. So that leads to quite a complex questionnaire, which is quite unusual because, as you can see, we have several topics, while usually our questionnaires cover only one topic. It's also unusual because we have questions on the far future, while we usually ask people about their experience and their opinion on what they know uh, and what they have experienced. We also asked questions on policy to non-policy experts, uh, and the field work was during the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So to take all of that into account, we had a great care and we were very attentive to have um, titles and to have transitions to help respondents switch from one topic to another. But we were also very uh, attentive to the phrasing of the questions and of the modalities. And also some questions were only asked to patient representatives because they were very policy oriented. Um, so it ended up into a quite long questionnaire, about 30 minutes, uh, but we have a very good spontaneous feedback uh, for through emails that were sent to the rare barometer team, both on the quality of the questions and on the interest of the overall uh, questionnaire, which is uh, quite pleasing. So just to give you uh, an overview on the survey field work, uh, so we started the field work, which means the dissemination of the questionnaire uh, on the 3rd of December 2020, and we ended it on the January 17th, uh, 2021. So we reached out to almost 4,000 respondents worldwide and 3,770 in Europe. Like any rare barometer survey, uh, we, it was available in 23 languages. And for this survey, we have 70 countries and 978 diseases represented. So maybe you have already 
gone through the results of the survey because we launched uh, them before the summer. Uh, so you can access them in three different ways through a full report, uh, which is only available in English, but is uh, 46 pages, pages long. Uh, you will find there an in-depth analysis of a total worldwide sample of respondents, and you can use it as such, for instance, as an example of analysis for this survey, or also to compare uh, results uh, from other surveys or from breakdowns. You can also have access to a fact sheet uh, that we made, which is for pages long and uh, gives the key results uh, for the survey, the key findings. And it's available in 10 languages. And finally, you have a dashboard, which is 26 pages long and in 23 languages. And in this dashboard, you can see the results for all of the questions that we asked in numbers and in figures. And for your rewardist members, you can have access to the fact sheets and to the dashboards with individualized results, um, including uh, with breakdowns, uh, if there are enough respondents. So here are examples of the breakdowns you can access to per country, per uh, sex, for instance, or per, per disease also, or group of diseases, but also for uh, classes of prevalence, which is new to this um, to this survey because we could access the Orphanet uh, database of uh, epidemiology. And we thank Orphanet for that, uh, for also helping us integrating it into the rare barometer database. So we can now have results for people living with more common rare diseases and people living with very rare diseases. Also, just to give you another, look, another view on uh, the disease grouping therapeutic areas uh, that you can access, which are aligned with the um, therapeutic areas for the ERNs. Uh, so just to give you an overview on the, on the figures and of the number of respondents per therapeutic area. So now Anna will tell you how we used the survey results and how also you could use those results. Yes, um, so I mentioned, I think, in the initial slides, the, the structure of the chapters in, in these recommendations that you see on the left. Um, and when it comes to the input of um, people living with rare diseases through the surveys, um, there's a section per um, chapter. This one illustrates the chapter on accessing high quality healthcare. Um, it's a consolidation, as Jesse mentioned, of the results of surveys that we've had from the past um, and the, re re the results of this survey um, that have helped us kind of compile what the overall um, opinion of people living with rare diseases is on that particular um, subject. So although it's important um, certainly to keep in mind the breakdown of respondents in terms of which country or, or which disease they might be living with is they might not have the same opinion on each one of these things, depending on what that is. Um, we really made an effort, um, as we do always, um, to unite kind of the, the opinions of people with uh, living with rare diseases and draw really the major um, highlights at the end of that um, chapter to, to illustrate that it tr truly does respond um, to the unmet needs. So I think the next slide, um, We'll just go on to um, support um, a bit of information for you about what you can find um, in these recommendations. Um, they hopefully now, and you will be by the end of this um, webinar, convinced that they truly do represent um, the voice of people living with rare diseases. Um, but what you'll also find is that they can serve as a very good roadmap, um, not only for this, um, kind of wishful European action plan that we're advocating for, but also in our business as usual. Um, there's no reason why they can't be and already aren't actually, we know, being used um, to shape policy um, today, to either help shape national plans um, or in your internal policies where you work um, and certainly in regional um, approaches to, to helping people with, with rare diseases. So we really hope that they can be systematically used um, already um, and, and eventually be, be an official basis for this upcoming legislation. 
So the next slide um, gives you a few points around, around this uh, campaign for an action plan, and we'll give you more information about this at the end of the seminar, but in case you can't make it through to the end, we want to touch upon it here. Um, Again, um, this is a far jump kind of from the very granular questions that we ask people living with rare diseases. But what we were able to capture and to really uh, conclude from all of this field work, um, not only with people and advocates, but also from many of us um, as key opinion leaders in the field, is that we need this action plan for a number of reasons. We need to continually have a renewed focus of rare diseases as a priority. So in and of itself already, that's um, a, a very good reason. We know um, that to date, there is a lot of very great um, and promising initiatives, both at the European and national levels. Often they are still disjointed um, and often they lack funding. So two more reasons why we really need to update um, our policy framework with a new action plan. And finally, what's very unique to this uh, proposal that may have not at all existed before is the fact that we would like to introduce, and this was partly already laid um, in the groundwork of Rare 2030, was the introduction of measurable goals. So the only way that we can really get from where we are today to improved um, lives, improved quality of lives, um, and reduced inequalities um, is to make sure that we actually hold ourselves accountable for a number of goals. So we would introduce those in this action plan as well. Um, if we move to the next slide. Um, so if that wasn't already um, enough reasons to have um, an action plan, um, what we really focus on in the presentation or what we really concluded in from, from our results is that two big reasons why we really need this plan um, are that we have much more work to do. There's clearly um, a large unmet need um, that is still remaining for people living with rare diseases. Many of them starting, of course, in childhood, taking far too long to be diagnosed um, and still very poorly uh, understood. In terms of the inequalities, we still see profound differences between people living with rare diseases and those with not rare diseases. We know that they're much more significantly impacted both on psychological, but also social and, and economic levels. And we also know that they have a poor care experience um, and that's really not, not acceptable. And finally, we know that there's a very, very small percentage um, of rare diseases that currently only have um, a treatment on the market. And very few of those, of course, are transformative. So in and of itself, um, this gives us three good reasons um, overall in terms of why we need uh, a new action plan. The second reason that I mentioned, um, I think is on the next slide. Oh, sorry, first we'll go into the details of, of the first one. So um, one quite astonishing and I think quite profound finding um, from this study is that 79% of the respondents, so of the 3,700 people who responded, didn't think that they would be cured from their disease um, within the next 10 years. Um, I think this is, of course, a very large portion of the population. Um, and of course, um, as we'll see later, although finding um, treatments and investing in, in research and development and accessing orphan drugs still remains a priority, I think it really highlights um, something very important, which is that this large population needs um, more um, than just striving for new treatments. They need earlier diagnosis um, to better adapt to their uh, lives and family decisions. They need more social support. Um, they need more information um, in terms of the functioning of their disease. They need more uh, recognition of their human rights. Um, and they need more solutions to be able to reach the very good standards of care that already exist, despite the fact that there might be um, a treatment. So that was one very profound um, figure that helped us really substantiate the, the, the call on our campaign. So um, as I mentioned, of course, despite the fact that there was this um, projection into the future, um, the top priorities for people living with rare disease in terms of improving their care still included 50% of them that would like um, the um, investments into uh, seeking treatments that don't yet exist. 
Another 45% uh, strived for better coordination between uh, the care of the healthcare professionals that help them. 32% um, hoping to better access consultations with those who are specialized in their disease. And then 28% who called for better social recognition. So I think Jesse, you can give us a few more details about these um, statistics. Yes, exactly, because we also had some open questions and what people said in those open questions can help have more information uh, about those results. So regarding treatments and therapies, when people uh, were talking about treatments and therapies in open questions, uh, quite few of them uh, talked about medicines, but most of them were saying how they hoped that advanced therapies could help uh, cure the diseases. Um, regarding better coordination, so several comments uh, were asking for the possibility to be accompanied by one doctor or one person or one expert center to design a treatment plan or to uh, help patients and carers uh, in the care for the rare disease. So this claim is actually aligned uh, with the proposition of the Enough Care project. So for those who don't know, the Enough Care project was the title of the project that um, led to the survey, the rare barometer survey that is called Juggling Care and Daily Life. And one of the results of this uh, project was to uh, ask for uh, case managers, uh, which would be professionals supporting patients and carers living with rare diseases so that they could access health and social care services and support. And actually, so better coordination between Healthcare professionals, you can see that it's the second priority here to improve uh, the care. But if we look only to the, uh, at, the, at the carers, at the answers from the carers, uh, so better coordination between healthcare professionals is important, but they also cite as a third uh, priority, a better coordination between healthcare professionals and social care professionals. Um, so coordination is really important for carers. And also, if you look at the fourth priority, which is uh, better social recognition, and if we look at people who, respondents uh, with very rare diseases, this is their third priority. So better social recognition of the disease is especially important for people living with very rare diseases. And we also wondered, uh, and you maybe you wondered too, um, why diagnosis is not one of the top uh, in the top priorities uh, of people living with rare disease. So uh, we asked them actually in this question, what would uh, be important to improve their care? And 97% uh, of our respondents are already diagnosed. But if we look at the respondents who are not yet diagnosed, then a better diagnosis arrives as their first priority. Um, and then only treatments and therapies and better coordination between healthcare professionals. So that's part of the, of the reason um, why we don't see it in the, in the other priorities, in the priorities of the whole sample. And we also ask them, um what they think would be realistic and possible to access uh, within the next 10 years and Anna is going to tell you a bit more about these results yeah so in terms of this holistic approach that we see clearly coming through as a theme theme for the very rare but also a large majority of uh, people who don't have treatments yet um, is really the um, hope for more emotional support. We see 58% um, um, asking for psychological or, or emotional support for their diseases, better management of their symptoms, 49% um, uh, calling for that, um, and facilitating access to things in their daily life like employment, um, uh, and of course, being integrated better um, in, in, in society um, and not being discriminated against. So we're really striving um, to ensure that this next generation of policy, so we propose it in the form of an action plan, but in general, that this next generation of policies really um, keeps these um, unmet needs in, in mind. 
Um, the next slide um, looks a bit in focus on the very rare diseases. So we already saw Jesse pointed out one um, special sort of result um, that came when we when we looked um, and when we selected that subpopulation of, of respondents. Um, in this case, we see that there are a number of expectations that come from this group that might be a little bit different from the rest. And just to say quickly before Jesse goes into the, the details, um, we're very conscious of that um, and certainly in any proposals for an action plan, um, but also in the recommendations of VERA 2030, we recognize the fact that there might be the need for a bit of a tailored approach uh, for the rare, rare diseases. Yeah, so we looked at uh, how much different were the answers from people living with very rare diseases compared to those uh, of people living with more common uh, rare diseases to see if there was any specificity of uh, very rare diseases regarding access to holistic care or just social integration. And actually, so here we asked uh, again what they thought possible and realistic uh, to access for the next uh, 10 years. And it's when they said that they didn't think they could access this, access uh, those uh, social and human rights, that there was a very big and, and well, actually a significant, a statistically significant difference in their answers. And so you see the topics uh, in which the answers from people living with very rare diseases are significantly higher. And 40% of them don't think that they will be able to handle routine needs in, by 2030. 31% of them don't think that they uh, think that they will still be discriminated against uh, by 2030. 27% of them don't think that they will access adapted and accessible employment. And 23% of them don't think that they will be able to take part in education on equal footing with others. Um, so really those human and social rights are even further away for people living with very rare diseases than for other people living uh, with more common rare diseases. So back um, to the politics, to the policies. Um, this slide gives you a very abbreviated, of course, not everything is there, um, illustration of some of the um, regulations or soft legislations that have been uh, put forward in the last um, two decades um, that, that shape our, our policy in the field. Um, and what we, we're hoping to highlight, of course, is to situate how this proposed action plan um, fits in that timeline, but to also illustrate the fact that it's really a patchwork um, of, of legislations, again, some hard and some soft, um, that have served as a great legal basis for a lot of the infrastructures that we have um, today, but they don't entirely reflect the modern science um, certainly not the modern values, maybe, um, that we were able to consolidate in RARE 2030 through this survey and the larger consultation, and they certainly don't do it in a coordinated way. So that 2009 Council recommendation that we saw in the timeline um, really um, has some room for in improvement there, and so it's um, really our, our target in, in trying to propose something that that addresses all of those shortcomings that I just mentioned. So in terms of the survey, um, we really made sure to ask at least a few questions around some new technologies um, that were not and are not illustrated in, in a lot of the legal framework that we just looked at. Um, for example, we asked people what they thought about newborn screening and 95% of the respondents of the survey supported that um, program for, for rare diseases, despite the fact that it's actually quite patchy um, right now across the EU. Um, they also responded, a large majority of them, that they are willing to use remote consultations. Um, and that, for example, is not something that um, is reflected for the moment in our networks of, of care legislation, so the cross-border healthcare directive and all of the um, 
basis for the European reference networks um, that we currently have doesn't necessarily illustrate these needs and expectations in, in great detail. So that could be some, some interesting findings um, for all of us who are working on the updates of those. And certainly there's a lot more to be done um, at Eurydice, and I know my colleagues are planning all sorts of studies um, on topics for which we really need much more um, opinions for that reason, because there's so much that has changed in the last even few years um, that we need to make sure and keep up with, with um, the pace of people's opinions. So I think the next slide is just coming back um, to the action plan before we go into um, questions. I just wanted to kind of repeat some of the messages that I uh, stated at the beginning um, of the webinar, which is um, the fact that this um, Eurydice led um, initiative and campaign is really following um, on the request um, of the institutions to revisit policy and having had done the exercise of the rare 2030 foresight study, including this survey, um, we are um, calling for uh, a new framework um, now with even additional garnered support from our members of parliament and from a, a selected number of member states of, of whom we, we hope the group will be growing and growing um, in order to deliver a, a new action plan in the, in the coming years. Um, so for this, we certainly need you, your awareness, first of all, which is why I presented to you today. Many of you maybe have heard of it already, other of you haven't. You each might have a very different role um, to play, um, depending on where you um, work and live. Um, at the end of the, the webinar, we'll give you some uh, details about how you can get involved in the kind of grassroots portion, but certainly there's um, an opportunity for each of you to become familiar with the proposals of the campaign um, and, in, and to support it in, in the ways that you see fit. So I think with that, we will check maybe the chat for some questions. Yes, so let's do a question and answer round. Uh, Jenny, will you uh, start? Yeah, so a couple of questions have um, just come through in the chat. So um, Anne Lawler sent one through, which is, I think, a, a very good point and one that we hope to address with the action plan. So she says, rightly so, the problem with rare diseases is that they are seen outside the rare community as rare. So how do we get across to our respective policymakers that collectively we are common and so are the symptoms? Uh, rare diseases are a significant cause of physical, sensory and intellectual disability. We know that, so how come our health and social care services don't? Um, Anna, maybe you have an answer to that, put you on the spot. <laughs> I'm sure you have some too. Feel free, Jenny, to add on. Um, I think, yes, you address a couple of um, problems for which we do include solutions in the action plan. Again, the action plan goes across everything from making sure we identify where people live with living with rare diseases are, already making sure that we are accurately representing the, the numbers of people living with rare diseases. We say 20 million in the EU and 30 million in Europe. Maybe there's more we want to be sure of where um, those people are and how many there are. So already um, data collection and monitoring um, is part of that plan. Um, also, yes, certainly in terms of the real life um, impact that the rare diseases have on individuals and society, there's much, much more research to be done um, in being able to quantify that as well. So that's certainly part of our plan. And I think in general, um, there's um, a greater recognition, as I said, in terms of the modern values um, that human rights, inclusion in society, these are all worthy motivations. It's not just about the health economics. And so um, we have all the way up to the UN um, level, a recognition for the need of a resolution that we hope will trickle down to Europe, um, to some of the national policies that will slowly but surely um, make their way into really granular um, policies, programs, funded actions um, that make sure that we can demonstrate this um, to, the, to the greater public. So um, we totally agree with you, Anne. Um, and that's just a few examples of how we hope to make that um, happen. Yeah, and even down to the name of our campaign of 30 million reasons, you know, to show that we all, all across Europe are, um, are many. Um, Enrique uh, Contreras has uh, got a very good question, which 
is exactly why we are doing this. So some policies or pieces of legislation are not good enough, or, or even if they are good enough in theory, they may not be fully applied in a practical manner. Um, how can we make sure that policies end up being act actually applicable and efficient, resulting in a concrete positive impact for people living with a rare disease? Um, Anna, again, <laughs> I don't know if you've got an answer. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the the answer there is, is much of the same, uh, what I just said. Maybe the part that's quite relevant here um, is the impact portion. So again, I said one of the um, novel natures of this proposal um, is that it's going to have some measurable, some outcomes-based goals. Um, and of course, although on the one hand, that's very tricky in the field of rare diseases, I think we can all agree that our baselines um, are sometimes non-existent um, or often very uncertain. It's really a moment where we need to push ourselves, otherwise we'll never get um, beyond where we are um, today. We need to start reasonably and intelligently making some sort of um, goals. Again, at the international level, this is happening in the context of the sustainable development goals. If you scan the horizon, much like we did in Rare 2030, you consider, okay, what would be an achievable or reasonable goal? Of course, sometimes you fall short, but without making them, um, you can't really get make anyone accountable um, for the piece that they have to play. So I think in terms of impact, it's really the, the kind of flavor of the, of the decade. We're all in competition for funding for programs, and we really need to demonstrate that the ones that we have in place um, are, are having the Im improved impacts that we would hope that they would. Um, great. So we have um, also two questions around um, screening. So uh, Kirsten um, Boetner asks if there's any country where genetic uh, general genetic screening takes place um, and Vicky uh, um, McGrath from Ireland uh, asked around newborn screening I guess perhaps a question for, for Jesse um, but has your orders considered surveying wider society um, about attitudes to newborn screening um, given that it all um, would be subjected to testing? Um, Maybe yeah, regarding exactly. surveying the wider society, so no, not yet, uh, and actually the rare barometer program is really about surveying people living with rare diseases so that we can voice their experience and their opinion. Uh, in that case, that would be a completely different project, uh, which would still be interesting, but at the same time, we know that at least the medical world uh, and the care teams already have quite a lot of, um, well, there is a, quite a lot of literature uh, on the opinion of, of uh, the medical world on, on newborn screening and a lot of, of uh, literature on ethics questions that it raises. Um, so our goal here was just to have the voice of, of people living with rare diseases on this subject. But then of course, uh, there's more to, the, to this subject than uh, just people's opinion. Um, so yeah, no, no survey on the wider population for the moment. Having said that, and yeah, it's definitely out of the context, I think of the survey platform, Eurydice is part of a, a number of consortia that consider not only newborn screening, but um, other screening um, future approaches. Um, so yes, there is um, a, a very active kind of multi-stakeholder discussion happening right now around um, newborn screening. So we have more information for you on that. Um, if you're interested, Vicky um, and Kristen, um, and in terms of the, the opinions of patients, yeah, stay tuned for a um, diagnosis survey very soon. Um, great. I, um... Yeah, we have one more question uh, awesome. regarding the intervals of when we intend to repeat the survey. Um, yeah, <laughs> someone who's interested in increasing participation, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we probably won't have an um, action plan wide survey, maybe in 2030 to see how it is that we did, um, which we have certainly considered um, to have an update but we have regular intervals of surveys, usually on 
specific topics. Uh, maybe Jesse, you want to say a bit more there? Um, you yeah, know, there's no plan for the moment uh, to beat the survey. However, uh, all our all of our surveys are um, available, and you can also see, for instance, if you just go to the dashboard uh, that I presented just before, uh, you have access to all the questions. So the idea is that when we have a survey, of course, the interest uh, is to have as many people uh, living with rare diseases as possible answer the survey. Uh, so that's also why it's very important for uh, that that patient organizations do disseminate the survey uh, and for instance uh, maybe you heard about it but for the COVID-19 survey that we did uh, it was also very timely and and very specific uh, given the situation but some patient organizations that were considering doing a survey themselves on this topic just contributed to the design of our survey and to disseminating this survey to their members so that they can reach a high number of respondents and, and have their breakdown and use the results of the surveys. And actually some of them did um, write and publish some peer uh, peer-reviewed articles based on the review on, on the results of uh, the rare barometer survey. And in that case, anyway, the survey is open. And if you uh, ask uh, if you write to us, we will see if we can also send you the questions and we are very open for people living with rare diseases using our survey and repeating our surveys if, if needed. Yes, I think that was the last question in the question and answer round. And we can continue on the next part of the uh, webinar, but please feel free to still use the question and answer. We can try to answer you uh, accordingly. Yes, thank you, uh, Andrea. And for this part, uh, I will be presenting the results of the survey on remote healthcare. So we wanted to have a special focus on this subject because uh, we all saw how the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdowns, uh, all we all used uh, remote work, uh, remote tools um, for our daily life and including remote healthcare. So that was really one of the results of uh, the COVID-19 survey. And as I said, it was mostly included into the open questions. Uh, so when we asked people what was the most, um, what were the positive and the, the negative aspects um, of the of, of the care they received during the nineteen uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic? Many of them talked about uh, remote healthcare, and both the, both the the positive and the negative aspects. So we really had some insights, but that we also wanted to measure, thinking that that's something that will change uh, healthcare. Uh, for the upcoming years, um, and especially if we want to think about healthcare for 2030, we had to include uh, remote healthcare. So I wanted to uh, show you a quote uh, that is very good in the sense that it really sums up the results of uh, the COVID-19 survey and of this survey regarding the use of remote healthcare. So we will really try to present those results in a complex way because uh, it's not just people living with rare diseases or not just willing to use remote healthcare at, in, in any case or at any cost, uh, but there's more to it than just um, having remote consultations and remote healthcare. So here you see that anyway, like I guess any patient, uh, people living with rare diseases prefer to be treated locally through face-to-face -face consultation. And this patient in Malta said, told us that a face-to-face -face consultation is always the best option, especially if it's the first meeting of a patient with a specialist. There's the human contact, which helps us to better explain and understand each other so as to establish the right diagnosis and protocol. There is also the delicate matter of how to break the news to a patient so that she or he has a rare disease, which is most cases causes a lot of distress to the patient. 
but some follow-up consultations can then be held remotely. So there's a lot in this quote. Uh, the fact that consult remote consultations are interesting if it's for follow-up consultations, but for main um, changes in the, in the care trajectory, such as having a diagnosis or uh, changing something into their care, they would prefer to have face-to-face -face consultations for those occasions. This being said, when we look at the results of the survey, we see that many people would be willing to use either remote prescriptions or remote consultations, mostly from time to time, but also, sometime, uh, but also sometimes for all of them. We will go deeper into that. But the first reason for them to use remote consultations and remote prescriptions are to save time. And we know from the survey that we did in 2017, which is called Juggling Care and Daily Life, that care-related tasks have a very serious impact on the everyday. For 40 people of the respondents uh, of the survey, they represented more than two hours a day. And for some of them, it was uh, even more every day. So this explains why for 75 of the respondents, they would be willing to access remote prescriptions to save time. So that's the first reason they told us. Um, and for 53% of them, they would be willing to use remote, remote consultations also to save time. And especially we see that 85% of the respondents would be willing to receive prescriptions by email all the time. And 68% would be willing to receive medicines by mail all the time. If we look at the reason what, why they would be willing to access um, remote consultations, we see that it's mostly to access high quality and multidisciplinary care. So the graph is a bit complex. I really wanted to show you all of the, all of the results and not to simplify them. But what we can see here is that here we have multidisciplinary care, for instance, uh, with us, with specialists and their uh, general practitioner, or also having access to some specialists abroad. And in that case, even if uh, only a minority would be willing to use remote consultations all the time, more of them would be willing to use remote consultation all the time for to access high quality care than um, remote consultations from time to time or only if there is no, the, no other option. But for local care with a general practitioner or with a specialist, people would, would rather um, have face-to-face -face consultations. So for instance, here you see that uh, the most answered option is from time to time. And also they answered much more um, that they would be willing to have remote consultations with local doctors only if there's no other option, like in times of crisis. We also see that they told us uh, people living with, with rare diseases don't think that remote consultations are appropriate for all types of healthcare. And while, when we ask them which type of healthcare uh, is best for remote consultations, they tell us that psychological or emotional support um, is more appropriate. Also that uh, blood tests or other types of clinical tests or analysis ca that can be done at home um, is a bit more, well, a bit less adapted, but still um, a majority of them is considered it uh, adapted. But it's really not adapted to give a diagnosis or even for physiotherapy sessions. And I also wanted to give you some quotes. Uh, so for instance, this patient from Latvia saying that in person, the doctor is able to notice a lot that you might not notice during a video call. Psychological aspects can change the outcome of the consultation and are practically ignored during the virtual consultation with a doctor. So in that case, it's not a specific uh, psychological uh, consultation with a, with a psychologist. Or even this patient and carer from Sweden saying that it's difficult to know, for example, if you do an exercise correctly in a physiotherapy 
uh, before you have done it. But remote consultations can be excellent for follow-up consultations or as a complement. Uh, and it's really this idea that once you have met the care team and met your doctor face to face, then for follow up consultations, it can be easier to have remote consultations. And this is um, actually what this uh, question tells us about is that so you see so in the first question we asked them if they would be willing to have remote consultations if they had already met face to face with the professional they would be having a consultation with or if they would not be willing, uh, well, if they would be willing to have a remote consultations, if they would not have met the professional, they would have a consultation with. And we can see of this graph uh, that respondents are more willing to use remote, remote consultations from time to time anyway, uh, than all the time, uh, hence keeping some face-to-face -face consultations. Also, uh, that they would rather have face to um, remote consultations only if there is no, no other option when they have not already met the care team. And that even 22% of respondents would not have a remote consultation, even in times of crisis, if they would have never met with the professional they would meet for this consultation. So this really aligns uh, with the results that we have in the COVID-19 survey. Uh, once again, that the remote consultations are more adapted for follow-up. But they would they, they also told us, uh, you also told us in the COVID-19 survey that uh, some consultations or some remote consultations are really adapted into some specific circumstances. So for instance, during the pandemic, Many people living with rare diseases were trying to reach out to their hospital to ask quick questions such as, can I go to the hospital? Is it um, safe for me to go to the hospital? And sometimes the process was very heavy to take an appointment just for small questions. And in that case, uh, remote consultations, would it be just reaching out to the uh, care team through the phone uh, was, uh, would have been very uh, useful. And just a last quote to finish on remote consultations. Uh, so this patient from the Netherlands saying, I was searching for specialists and experts from other countries to understand my condition. Ideally, they are around and you can meet them from time to time, but I prefer to talk with knowledgeable experts via the phone compared to a meeting with, uh, to meeting a doctor or a specialist who does not understand my condition. It will make diagnosis and treatments much easier. So we also see here that one of the big, um, one of the importance of remote consultations is that when you cannot access high quality and specialized care locally, then if it can allow you to have access to uh, high quality health care, remote consultations are still better than poor quality health care locally. But to access high quality healthcare, you so people living with rare diseases, like all um, people living in the European Union at least, um, also have access to cross border healthcare. And we wanted to add some questions uh, on this aspect, knowing especially um, that they will be they would be uh, evaluations of the cross border directive. Um, and uh, to know a bit more uh, how to shape uh, all those policies uh, by 2030. So what we did to measure uh, access to cross-border healthcare was that we used uh, questions that were asked in a Eurobarometer, so a barometer that is um, made by the European uh, Union, in the European Union. And in this uh, special Eurobarometer, they asked questions on um, access to cross-border healthcare to the general uh, population of the European Union. So the interest to copy the same question, and we thank uh, the Eurobarometer for giving, a, giving us access to, the, to their questions and to their translations, and to allow us to use those questions in uh, this survey. So the interest is that we can now 
compare the responses of people living with rare diseases to those that were given by the general EU population. And we see, so if we add people who answered yes and people who answered that they would be willing uh, to travel to another country to receive medical treatment, depending on the medical treatment or on the country, we have 86 people, uh, 86, sorry, percent of uh, respondents living in the uh, um, European Union who would be willing to travel to another country to receive medical treatment. And this is much higher. Uh, it's a much higher percentage than in the general EU population where we had 49% of uh, the respondents who were considering traveling to access treatments. Only 9% said that they would not be at all willing to uh, travel to access um, medical treatment in a, another country. So if we look at the country breakdown for EU, uh, you will see that these answers do uh, change depending on the country where respondents live. So some of them answered, uh, gave a higher um, response. So this is only for the yes. So if you remember the previous slide, we had 44 people, person of the of the respondents living with rare diseases who said they would be willing to travel um, anyway. And here we see, so in purple, uh, the countries where respondents are significantly more willing to travel than uh, the average um, population of people living with rare diseases. And in blue, the countries were uh, people would be less willing, significantly less willing to, to travel to access care. So in that part, of course, on cross-border healthcare, we will uh, focus on respondents from the European Union, but we still asked this question uh, to non-EU, to respondents not living in the EU. And I just wanted to show you uh, some of the responses that we had for the countries where we have at least 20 respondents. So you see here the countries where uh, people would be more willing to travel and those where they would but be as willing to travel. And if you look at the report um, that we published, you will see all the detailed results for non-EU countries, uh, so you can access it in the report. So now regarding the respondents living in the EU, again, uh, we asked them, we asked to those who were willing to travel uh, to access treatment in another country, why they would be willing to travel. And the main reason, uh, well, actually, if you look at um, the first and second and third reasons uh, for respondents living with rare diseases, you see that it's in the same order as in the EU population, but that those three, those first three responses, uh, we have a higher percentage of people living with rare diseases who chose them. So receiving treatments that are not available in their country, receiving better quality treatment, receiving treatment from a renowned specialist. So having access to high quality care or better quality care and treatment uh, than in their own country. And if we look at the two last reasons, uh, reasons four and five, receiving treatment more quickly and cheaper treatment, um, we also see that fewer people living with rare diseases chose uh, those, those answers compared to the general EU population. And for those who were not willing or were not always willing to uh, travel to access care in other, in a, well, to access treatment in another EU country, we also asked them why. And we gathered uh, a bit the responses because it was quite clear that the first reason for not traveling to another country was that they preferred local care or were satisfied with it. So it was really satisfaction with local care. The second reason is that they lacked information and it can be of information on the availability and quality of treatment abroad, on patient safety and quality of care or on their rights in case things would go wrong. The third reason, reason was about language issues, uh, such as difficulties understanding the language. 
And the, lead, the final reason uh, was uh, related to money issues, either that they cannot afford cross-border health care or that they are not sure that they would be reimbursed for the care they would have access to abroad. And the last question we asked them about cross-border healthcare was uh, actually how much they knew about their rights. So once again, we used the questions as they were asked in the Eurobarometer survey um, on three aspects of uh, the rights to access cross-border healthcare. So we took three, three statements and we asked respondents whether they thought those statements were true or false. And here you see the percentage of people who found the right answer. So the first statement was, you have the right to receive planned medical treatment in another country in the European Union and to be reimbursed for that treatment by national health authority or health insurer. And what we see is that 44% of uh, people living with rare diseases said, said that uh, this statement was true, which is true. Um, and while 57% per per of uh, the general EU population said also that it was true. So for this statement, uh, for the, their right to receive planned medical treatment and be reimbursed for it, it seems that people with rare diseases know, uh, don't know their rights as much as the general EU population. And you see here also uh, on the two last columns uh, where the countries where the modality was significantly overrepresented, uh, which means significantly above the average. And also on the very last column where uh, people were even less aware of uh, this right. Um, so I'll let you look at the, at the results. Um, we have some quite different countries there. The second statement uh, is about getting a prescription from their doctor to use in another country in the European Union. And 26% of people living with rare diseases said, said that it was true, uh, which is true, actually. Uh, it's a bit fewer than in the general population. And all, once again, you can see the responses per country. So. Uh, knowledge about their rights is really not uh, the same depending on the European countries they live in. And finally, we told them, we asked them if they knew uh, if they had the right to receive a copy of their medical record from their doctor when they seek to receive healthcare in another country in the European Union. So in that case, uh, they did better than the general population uh, because 76% of them said that it was true. And once again, there's a disparity in the answers uh, per country. So that's it about uh, cross-border healthcare and access to cross-border healthcare. Um, so we wanted also to show you, so Anna uh, presented quite extensively how we've been using the, sur uh, the survey results into the 2030 recommendations and in the action plan, uh, in the campaign for an action plan for rare diseases. But uh, those results were already used also at least by Eurodis um, in our answer to the cross-border healthcare evaluation uh, that was due by July 2021, but also in our uh, answer to the evaluation of the European health data space also due uh, in July 2021. So as you can see, uh, the whole goal of the laboratory program is really to survey people living with rare diseases, to gather the voice uh, of people living with rare diseases, to gather your voice so that we can have more patient-centric patient policy decisions and also improved outcomes and experiences. Um, this is what Herodis is doing with the Road 2030 recommendations and the 30 million campaign. This is also how you can use our results, would it be general results or individualized results for your own advocacy activities. Um, 
maybe we can take some questions before uh, we talk about what's coming next and our upcoming surveys and actions. Yes, let's do that. We have some more questions. Uh, Jenny, would you like to be the uh, the reader again? <laughs> yes, super. So we've had um, a question from Michaela uh, asking, um, oh, sorry, my screen cut off. If the experiences or perceptions of people living with rare diseases surveyed, um, what were the experiences uh, regarding the use of digital health, e.g. for monitoring of symptoms? I think you've know, gone over some of those, Jesse, but... Uh, is there anything in particular to to pull out? Uh, no, there there was no particular question on this subject, and I don't think it really uh, was mentioned in the open questions. I didn't see it anywhere. Um, no, no, it's quite specific actually, and we were quite careful because it would have brought us to a completely different topic. Uh, and I mean, that's very interesting, and I, I'm sure that we will uh, go deeper into that in, in the in the future. But uh, nothing in this survey specifically on on those uh, uses. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thanks. Um, another question um, from Mark uh, on teleconsultation, uh, commenting that it's preferred when diagnosing and or initiating therapy, um, but dispensing of medication by mail is preferred always. Why is this? Um, by the start of a treatment uh, with medicinal product pharmaceutical care is also essential to explain the use make sure it's safe to understand kind of adverse side effects and things like that i don't know if you have any comment yeah um i think that so uh there was no really open comment on this question actually mm -hmm. but what we could probably say based on the results that we have is that many of our respondents are in uh, have access to chronic care and what we can see is that most of the time they have to renew prescriptions uh, and that in that case, they really prefer to have it uh, by mail. But you saw, I think that the figure was 85% were willing to have it by email. So um, most probably what we can think is that when it's a new prescription and that it's accompanied with um, uh, discussion about the treatment how and the use and the possible side effects uh it's not just having the 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 having them by by mail it's also the whole consultation that is important uh but then once again um it's it's mostly for follow-up that remote healthcare is preferred and we can very well imagine that most of our of our respondents um have follow-up care also especially regarding prescriptions. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, an interesting question from Peter around the difference between the Eurobarometer uh, survey in 2014 and the survey uh, that we did for 2030 in, in 2021 um, about perceptions on cross-border healthcare. He rightly comments that the use of technology um, has changed a lot in these years, especially due to COVID. So is there anything to understand the, the difference between these surveys? Any yeah, the use, there? exactly. The use of technology, of course, even if in that case, I don't know if it really changes anything. Actually, we thought because we did the field work during the COVID-19 pandemic, and while many European countries were in lockdown, uh, so we were very attentive to add, for instance, in the question, if I get back to, uh, to the question, that within the next 10 years and outside times of crisis, because we were a bit concerned that people would say that they were not willing to travel because of safety issues. Um, so if in that case, uh, they would be willing to travel. And we were quite surprised by the answers. Um, so to me, the use of technology can maybe explain a bit of it, um, but not that much because that's actually traveling. Uh, so maybe through the use of technology, people know more about what they can access in other countries, uh, but it doesn't ease that much the traveling between 2014 and 2021. 
Um, however, maybe it makes people more aware of this possibility. Um, no, something that could be different, um, well, that could also explain part of the difference and we could not overcome this difference uh, in methodology was that the Eurobarometer uh, survey was done by the phone. So when they asked this question, they only gave the possibility to, say, to answer yes or no. And when people by themselves told it depends on the medical treatment or the country, then they recorded this answer. We did not have this possibility because the, the rare barometer survey was online uh, and people answered it themselves. So they had the possibility to say, yes, it depends and no. So this can explain part of the difference uh, between the 42% that you see on the left and the 16% that you see on the right. But still, and that's an interpretation, but I think that it's also because um, of the specificity of rare diseases and the scarcity of the expertise and the fact that many people with rare diseases have to travel to access high quality healthcare or just healthcare at all. So that's also why we used um, this um, figure of 86% of people say, saying that they would be willing in any case or depending on medical treatment or the country uh, to travel. And still, we have very high differences, especially if you look at the no there, 9% compared to 46%. Um, I think it really tells something about the specificity of rare diseases. Excellent. I agree. My first thought. Um, but I, I, um, Paul has added something which is, is more around the kind of um, telemedicine, but um, Maze, could you assume that responses are worse from respondents that are less capable of, capable of using the internet? So I guess there is obviously um, a, a point on digital literacy there and also in terms of also people responding to our survey have to have access to the internet. Yeah, well. of course, of course. And that's one point, if you look at the report, uh, we did have some methodological um, um aspects uh, dealt and we remind that it was an online survey so of course those who answered did answer in line uh, and are kind of already used to using online tools so that's one of the difficulty uh with using online survey it's really for rare diseases it's really good because it allows us to have access to many people uh, to which we don't have access otherwise. But of course, uh, there's this digital literacy um, aspect that we have to take into account, of course. Um, super, thank you. Um, I don't know if there's any other comments before I respond to uh, Rubens, which probably leads on nicely to um, to the our final call um but he says um when we talk about and, and it's true when we talk about healthcare professionals we don't often mention pharmacists and and their um, important role in care of people uh living with rare disease so what can they do to support more people support, um living with a rare disease uh i will come on to one reason probably <laughs> one thing you can help us with um, I don't know if anyone else has any comments on, on, on the role of pharmacists uh, in particular. No. I guess I can just add a general um, increase in, in awareness, um, much like GPs and much like other first line healthcare professionals, I think still, um, yeah, it's not very um, modern, maybe not very digital, um, but it's still a very effective way to, um, to help yeah, steer people to the right resources, because even just recognizing the fact that something is a rare disease can put you on the right pathway when it, whether it means, um, yeah, accessing specialists, but also this entire universe of infrastructures that not everyone might be aware of. So there are, as I, as we mentioned at the beginning, um, a good patchwork of policies that allow people to have access to all sorts of things that could help them, but they don't always know that they're um, there. Yeah, so should we continue on the uh, presentation? Nope. 
Thank you everyone for your very good and interesting questions. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, I wanted to now look at uh, what's coming and uh, on our upcoming rebarometer re survey on diagnosis. Uh, so it's a survey that is actually ongoing, not um, for the questionnaire that will be coming by the end of the year, but we already started to have a first qualitative phase uh, through the participation of 80 patient representatives uh, in an online panel uh, that ended uh, one or two weeks ago. And the uh, the, the objective of this uh, project um, on diagnosis is to identify personal and external factors that influence the process of obtaining a timely and accurate diagnosis from a patient perspective. So really, the idea is to look at how you reach out to uh, this diagnosis and how we can, through advocacy activities or through your work, um, accelerate uh, the access to diagnosis for people living with rare diseases. So as I said, uh, we started a qualitative phase because we thought that uh, so qualitative phase would be just to ask you open questions and to tell for you to tell us uh, what you think would be well, what is your experience uh, of accessing a diagnosis so that we can analyze it and see what are the steps to access diagnosis and on which step there could be improvement and how we could improve uh, access to diagnosis through each step, but also to different um, types of patients, uh, because there may be inequalities in access to diagnosis, even within rare disease uh, patients. Um, and that also allows us to have uh, your view on uh, recommendations to improve access to diagnosis. Um, and for this survey, we are working uh, with the Global Commission to End the Diagnosis Odyssey for Children Living with Rare Diseases, who is partially funding this uh, uh, project um, and we're working with rare diseases international so uh, including in the first phase we are of course uh, into this qualitative first phase we are of course uh, targeting European countries but also especially six non-European countries Argentina, Australia, Brazil, the Emirates, Malaysia and South Africa um, so we are starting to analyze uh, the results of the qualitative phase and uh, to which some of you I know already participated. And we're now preparing a questionnaire, uh, so a quantitative uh, phase of this survey. And we plan to have a field work by the end of the year. And this time not in 23 languages, but in 25 languages, because we would include Arabic and Malaysian. Uh, so, I mean, one more reason to help us disseminate this survey and answer to this survey so that everybody can use the results, including individualized results with breakdowns in your advocacy activities, in addition to your word uses. And Jenny, you wanted to talk to us about the action plan? Yes, so um, now it's time for your call to action. Um, so as Jesse and Anna have explained, um, we obviously want you to be able to take these results and use them in your advocacy with your uh, policy makers um, to, to show them uh, why we need change on diff many different levels, but in particular in a call for um, Europe's action plan for rare diseases. So as Anna explained at the beginning, um, this is a result of the rare 2030 recommendations that, that the survey contributes to directly. Uh, but there is one quick and easy thing that you can do. Perhaps you have done it already. Uh, so throughout the webinar, we had all the hard facts and figures, the statistics of why we need this action plan. Um, but in fact, oh, there are so many more reasons. Uh, and indeed, every person living with a rare disease in Europe is a reason for Europe to take action. So we are um, collecting these reasons, these testimonies from um, everybody, uh, the whole rare disease um, community, so uh, people living with rare diseases, healthcare professionals, pharmacists, um, industry, 
um, to directly take this voice of the community, these reasons to the European institutions and Europe's health ministers um, to set out in their words um, what it would mean to have this comprehensive action plan. So um, these reasons vary quite a lot. We have some really personal ones um, highlighting a particular disease or cause. We have some general uh, reasons uh, with human rights angle of, you know, this isn't right, and um, a general show of support. So please, uh, there's a couple on the screen now, but please take, if you can, um, two minutes to write your own reason um, and to share it with your, your networks and your communities, because we need everybody in the rare disease community to, uh, to contribute, as I said before, people, patient advocates, people living with rare diseases, everybody in the field. And we will take these reasons um, directly to the European institutions um, to maximize the kind of the voice of our community alongside the uh, the statistics and the and the policy recommendations, uh, so that we have the voice uh, coming through extremely strongly. So hopefully the link has been uh, added in the chat and um, also our contact details if you have any any further questions. So thank you. So yes, you have here all the links uh, that you should need. If you need anything else, you have all the contact details uh, you can write to us you can also i think andrea added um the links also in the chat especially on the survey results but also uh, you can go to the rubber Met voices um web page to the action.orioridis.org web page uh, to give us your reason for an action plan for rare diseases um, and we wanted to end this webinar by thanking all of you uh, all of the respondents to the survey, well, this, to the survey on, on the future of rare diseases, but also to all of the other surveys um, that allowed to have um, more robust uh, results for uh, all of our actions, and especially for the Rare 2030 recommendations and for the action plan. We wanted to thank our partners uh, for Rare Barometer and Rare 2030 and also our corporate donors in 2021 who contributed to uh, our program and allowed us to have uh, this survey uh, on the future of rare diseases. Uh, this all corresponds not only to our work, but to a massive effort and to all of those who participated, not only to, to the survey, but also to the World 2030 foresight study. So uh, thank you to all of you. And share your reasons and share uh, the links to the upcoming survey on diagnosis.